uh, my name's Dop, obviously, um, because too many people in the late 70s named their kids Michael. Uh, I think we have three or four at, at YesNet. Um, so I'm just going to do a quick introduction of myself so you have some background on where I'm coming from. Um, I want to talk about something that I feel is really, really important. Um, then, like, like Jeanette mentioned, we're going to do a kind of a two-part presentation, kind of a two-for-one. Um, I, I shortened my first part based on some work um, that we were able to get done this summer. Um, talks over uh, covert timing channels. That uh, was pretty interesting. Um, so uh, I spent almost 10 years um, at NCSA. Um, then I took a, a, a brief stint and, and did penetration testing for a major bank where I decided that I hate PCI. Uh, so uh, luckily, uh, thanks to Greg's help, uh, I joined ESNet in February 2015. Um, it's been great since then. Um, if anyone in the audience knows Nick Baraglio, um, this is a, a rendition of me he made. Um, what you may not know is that Nick spent six and a half years in art school. Uh, so we're, we're pretty glad he's a network engineer. So like I said, I want to talk, I want to talk about something pretty important. Uh, and and uh, last year at uh, BroCon, I don't, a number of you weren't here last year um, or in M at MIT, but I noticed a number of presentations um, that used pyramids to describe their architecture. Uh, the hierarchy of, you know, raw packages, events, policies, logs. Um, and someone very astute in the audience pointed out that's not a pyramid, that's a triangle. Uh, so I wanted to correct that. This is an actual pyramid. Um, but that's not good enough because uh, when, when I talk, like, well, you know, policies, logs, what, what, do we, what do we need now? We need notices, right? So that's, that's on top. <laughs> and that doesn't work. It just falls right off. So, um, uh, you know, I don't know how the Egyptians sell it, but rebuilding a pyramid takes about 20 minutes on an airplane using Adobe Illustrator. Um, so I want to uh, kind of, speakers everywhere, please start using the trapezoidal prism. Uh, it lets you add new things on top at any time. Also called the Mayan pyramid. Um, so this is where I added the notice correlation on top of my notices. <laughs> uh, and the best part about this, the Mayans were geniuses. Um, is, is not only do you have an architecture that you can build on top of in the future, um, you can also have a party on top. <laughs> so that's where this is coming from. <laughs> uh, all right, so all joking aside, I've not wasted two and a half minutes. Um, Multi-notice correlation. Um, uh, as, as several people have mentioned, um, you know, Bro ships with tons of stuff. Um, and there's these, all this funding for, for having a, a script repo that I'm really excited to contribute to. Um, but we also know that, you know, policies have to be tuned to what your, your network looks like, what your users are doing. Um, so here I was um, at a brand new job. I wanted to kind of make a name for myself or do something useful, um, which hopefully everyone likes to do at new jobs. Um, and I, wanted to, so I wanted to start blocking some bad stuff and, and be able to say, hey, I've done this thing, um, but I don't know anything about the network. You know, honestly, I didn't know if we had an HPC. I didn't know, you know what our users were. You know, I didn't know anything about that. So I also didn't want to be the guy that comes in you know, first day on the job and starts blocking a bunch of really important things. Um, so how can, I, how can I speed that up uh, and do something useful? So the, the first example I came up with um, was using SSH password guessing, uh, combining that with, with Intel notices and Intel feeds. Um, I couldn't simply just start blocking SSH password guessing. I know Ashish probably does. Uh, but um, I didn't, again, I didn't know our users. I didn't know where we were coming from. I knew we had some stuff over in Europe uh, at CERN, so I, I can't block on just everything. Um, and Intel, as we all know, is really, really useful. It's great for, for kind of getting that extra little layer, um, but you can't always trust it. You know, what, where, is, where is your Intel coming from? Who is inserting, you know, your friend's IP into the feed so that they can't log into work anymore, you know? Uh, well, that's fun stuff. And we run with about 100,000 indicators on a regular basis. But if I can correlate these two things together and find out which thing is seen in Intel and in SSH at the same time, um, uh, that'd be very useful to me. Um, so the basic flow of what this looks like in code is not very long. I'm just keeping track of a, a table of IPs, which has a table of notice types that they flag on and a count of how many times we've seen that. Um, not very memory intensive at all, at least in our case. Um, and I set up a couple, couple of variables pretty, pretty simply. Um, I'll go a little bit into what these different notice types mean. Most, most of these are just like different examples of, okay, for this I want to be, I want to block something. For this I want to be told about it. For this I want to be, I want it to block and I want it to wake me up at night. You know, that kind of stuff. Um, and then we have a redefinable um, notice types that we want to go ahead and correlate on. And in my local.bro has like 20 or 30 different notice types in there. 
Um, and then the, the real meat of it is the logic of when to throw which notice. But actually doing this is just, you know, when, you, when you, a notice is thrown, we, we go over this logic. Um, and in the case of Intel, I do it on the log Intel event because I didn't, there's a flag in Intel. I'm sure some of you know you can, you can set your Intel to throw a notice every time Intel's hit. I didn't want to see that. <laughs> so I did it in the, the, the log Intel event instead. Um, and that worked out pretty well. So what's that look like? Um, this is a, a, a just a quick example, notice log entry of uh, SSH password guessing in Intel. Um, the, the, the key point I pulled out here is that Intel was seen 24 times for this IP, and then it finally caught up SSH password guessing hit its threshold um, and, and decided to go ahead and block it. Um, pretty straightforward um, as far as the initial way we started doing this. Um, we started doing this obviously in, in, in 2015, but for kind of current data-wise, uh, in the month of July, uh, we had 41 unique IPs, SSH password guessing, and 12, only 12 of those were in Intel. So that tells us a couple things. Um, obviously, we can we can block those. Those 12 would have been blocked, right? Um, the Intel feeds obviously only go so far. There's what 30. 28, 29, uh, uh, if my math is right, um, other IPs that we didn't block. Um, that's not good. <laughs> um, but maybe we can look at that and adjust our thresholds now that we know there's this correlation. So that what that ended up doing is leading us to um, creating an SSH4 in threshold block, which is basically the exact same thing, except much lower thresholds for non-US IPs. So instead of the 41 IPs you see at the higher threshold, we were able to block 139, um, which only 60 of those were in Intel. Um, so we end up writing a better policy based on the information we gained uh, from the correlation. Um, but obviously, it's not just SSH that this works with. Um, we also have uh, two other policies I wrote um, uh, as a result of, of some stuff that was going on. Um, ESNet was, we have DNS resolvers that, that get hammered for a number of reasons. We host a lot of uh, domains that aren't just ES.net. Um, and we were getting a lot of queries and, and, and things that were kind of getting hammered. Um, Again, I can't just auto block on a bunch of DNS queries. You know, we're <laughs> a major network. There's there's a lot of legitimate reasons to be doing a lot of DNS queries. Um, uh, and then we also had another policy I wrote um, for the CVE 2015-7547, which is a, a DNS uh, denial of service. Um, which that policy is not very good. I admit it. I'm the first one to admit it. Um, uh, it results in a lot of false positives. But when combined together in correlation. They can, they, can, they can tell us something. Um, so in this case, uh, when combined with Intel, the request threshold was able to block 13 unique IPs uh, in June. Um, but the more interesting thing is when we, we start seeing correlation that doesn't involve Intel at all, where we have a lot of DNS requests and also this possible um, attack at the same time, and we block that as well. Um, so that's where I, I thought it really, really helped. Um, in this case, the offending host was in the Netherlands, so Martin. I'm looking at you. Uh, and we also did some correlation with uh, denial of service traffic. So um, uh, we were the target, like, as, every, as everyone is, of, of sin flooding attacks. Um, we wrote two policies. We weren't really sure which ones had the best thresholds. Uh, you know, do we want to see you know, a lot of sins really fast or you know, a, a, a bunch of you know, sins over, over a longer period? Um, and in this case, you know, these two policies, we, you know, 19 caught the first one, four and the second, and, then, and that last four, which is a different four, even though the same number, uh, tripped both those policies. Um, and in that case, you know, we were able to write two policies fast, do the correlation to help answer the question of, you know, like what hosts are hitting both? What's going on here? You know, before we even ask the question of, of is there correlation, we start getting data, um, which really helps when you're, you know, one guy that just started a new job and doesn't have time to go through and do all the correlation by hand in, in the logs. Um, one other thing uh, I added, uh, which I didn't talk about yet, is uh, we could do correlation on, on single notices as well. Um, again, Ashish is probably going to kick me, but um, I don't block on just HTTP sensitive URIs. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I, I, didn't, you know, I didn't know, again, what our traffic is going to look like. So I set up a, a single notice threshold. So if something is trying to attack a lot of URIs, um, if it does it 10 times, or in this case, uh, you know, what our threshold is, and we'll go ahead and block on that as well, um, which has uh, been very successful for us. Um, it's also a, a not so well tested feature. Um, cause I, I kind of was thinking about, well, we're blocking all these, these password attempts and, and on Intel. 
you know, what happens if one of these is actually successful? Um, so I, I added a, a ability to add correlation for things we don't actually want to block on. Um, so in this case, we have the ability to, um, in, in the example, we're not going to block if it's Intel and SSH uh, success, um, which actually will send us, a, it'll, it'll block and send us an alarm. Um, but if it ends up going ahead and doing more, like it's uh, Intel notice with SSH success and DNS request threshold, even though we said don't block on, on SSH success, it'll go ahead and block that, that attacker. Um, and we haven't actually, it's not well tested because we haven't actually seen that in practice. We have, luckily have not had Intel people um, logging into our machine successfully. Um, so most of the cases here you see, you know, like 24 Intel and like that one hit is the thing that causes the block. Um, what does it look like when you are doing tracking correlation for uh, a whitelisted scanner? Um, and you start getting, seeing things like numbers like these. Um, tons of DOS attempts, you know, it, bash header attempts 3,700 times, HTTP sensitive post 800 times. Um, so it gets just kind of interesting to see, um, you know, what would you actually see if uh, your, your whitelisted scanner was no longer whitelisted? Um, so I'm going to wrap up part one here pretty quick. Uh, I got uh, time for a couple questions. But uh, again, it's, it's pretty simple. Um, all the code, uh, I just pushed the, the, the most recent changes up to GitHub uh, yesterday. Um, and a little while back, I, I, I made a, a guest blog post on Sam's blog here. Again, these URLs are going to be available in the notes um, or whenever you post them. Um, it's a great win if you're at a new job. Uh, it's great for testing new policies that you're not totally set with. Um, you know, if you're, uh, you know, Vlad and Justin, you've been at your job for a thousand years, maybe. Uh, it's not as useful for you, but I think for a lot of the, the people that are new to Bro, this uh, could give you a lot of power. Um, any quick questions on this? <laughs> I can do that. Can we just copy that one? Yeah. <laughs> well, I should probably update Sam it. Won't sue. No, Sam won't sue. Anything else? Yes? Um, actually, the whitelisting is, is handled by our blocking infrastructure. So, like, our, our system will decide, you know, the correlation engine will say, hey, this needs to be blocked. And then when we actually go to make that blocking decision, that's when the whitelisting happens. So this case, like the, the, the one I showed previously, uh, where it just kept counting the whitelisted host, um, what's happening is Intel, or the correlation just keeps, keeps counting. It doesn't care. But since the host never gets blocked, it just keeps counting. Oh, you first. <laughs> um, no, not really. Um, I guess we, uh, I have like probably 20 or 30 uh, notices in my, th in my thing that gets correlated. Um, I haven't noticed any impact at all. Question for you? Yeah, so you did. Mm -hmm. Do you have a lot more? Um, I don't have a lot more of them, um, but the thresholds are tunable. Um, so you can you can say I want to I want SSH success to be uh, you know a multi correlation of like three or something. Then you can whatever whatever threshold you want for whatever notice you can you can set it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, just real briefly, um, and, and there's going to be more with, with the, the, the network control framework, I'm sure, um, and, and Justin's black hole uh, router code. But when, so when, we, when I say bro is blocking, um, bro isn't actually doing the blocking. Bro is making a decision to block. Um, and that's fired off as a to an external script, which um, hooks into a black hole router that has a BGP peering um, with our, our LAN routers. Um, and then, the, you know, Bro decides to block an IP, um, and then within a few seconds, probably milliseconds, it is blocked at the border and null routed, so we no longer see that traffic. Does that work? Cool. Yes. I haven't until now. <laughs> so that's good. Cool. All right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna stop questions on this so we can get Ross going. Um, 
to talk about covert timing channels. So if I can hand this to you, let me turn this off. Okay. Uh, so my name is Ross Gagan. I'm a first year PhD student at University of California, Davis. I spent this last summer doing a summer internship at ESNet. And my project has been on detecting covert timing channels using Bro. So first I'm gonna explain what covert timing channels are exactly, some of the common methods we use to detect them, and then go over some of our results and what we did to test. So first of all, what are covert timing channels? Um, there are many types of covert channels that have been developed. Basically, in general, it's a broad category. Covert channels could be anything that basically exploits an authorized channel to transmit information through it. Like, you could have a covert storage channel which uses IP headers to hide some information. In particular, we're looking at um, network IP covert timing channels. These hide data inside the packet delays of a network flow. And this can be exploited for a variety of malicious purposes, such as controlling botnets or leaking sensitive information. Uh, to go into a bit more detail on that, um, all traffic is going to have some degree of random variation. So you can imagine someone, Bob, is trying to send some standard traffic over the network to Alice. Normally, there won't be any issues. But if Bob somehow manages to manipulate this timing information beyond the normal random degree of variation, it's gonna be possible for them to embed some data that can get to the someone else on the network path without being spotted by the intrusion detection system. So this figure shows a basic example of how a covert channel might work. We have uh, long delays, which we use to embed a one bit, and small delays, which we use to embed a zero bit. So there have been many more complicated types of covert timing channels developed, and these can be divided into two broad categories, active channels and passive channels. Active channels send the data by creating their own traffic, while passive channels modify the existing traffic. An example of a passive channel would be Jitterbug, where you attach a small device to a keyboard, and then it can leak information by adding a different delay depending on which key is pressed. And for active channels, we have IPCTC. This is just a basic on-off channel. You either send a packet during a set interval to embed a one bit, or don't send during that interval for zero. Uh, Model-based covert timing channels and time replay try to mimic the legitimate traffic, so they're harder to detect. And basically, model-based tries to find a model that best represents the type of traffic it's mimicking and generate delays based on that, while time replay replays from two actual recorded sets of delays. So there's a, I'm gonna talk a bit about the different ways that these can be mitigated. Um, ideally, we wanna eliminate the covert channels or at least reduce their capacity as much as we possibly can. This can be achieved one way by adding noise to the flows, which makes it more difficult for them to carry data. However, this also has the problem of affecting the performance of legitimate applications too, and it's especially bad for applications like video chat or voice over IP where the timing information is really critical. So what we'd rather do is, instead of just adding noise to all the channels, we wanna be able to selectively pick out which ones are the most likely carriers of covert channels, and then decide if we wanna block them or not. So what our goal was to, is to develop policy scripts using Bro so we can report the likely covert timing channel flows. I'll go into more detail soon on how the scripts work, but the general idea is to have them monitor the packet delays for incoming traffic, and then compare the statistics such as the delay distribution to the values we expect based on training data we gathered. So covert timing channel detection tests can also be divided into two major categories. There's a shape tests, which report the first order statistics. This would be like the mean, variance, and distribution of the delays. 
And then we have regularity tests. This is a second order or higher statistics. So you're looking at correlations in the data. So two examples would be the Shannon entropy. This just gives the degree of randomness basically in the distribution itself. You take a histogram and find the entropy of the five bins, for example. And uh, corrected conditional entropy is a regularity test, which looks at the entropy given a sequence of delays. So if you have, say, 2,000 delays and you want to see what the entropy will be given the last 2,000 you've seen. Um, so far, we've included four common detection tests. The Shannon entropy, uh, corrected conditional entropy, and we also included the Kumulgorov Smirnov test, which is the, finds the maximum difference between two distributions. So you would have the legitimate distribution based on your training data and the measured distribution based on your traffic. And you just find the largest difference in the bins. And we lastly have the Kumulgorov, uh, I'm sorry, Kulbach Liebler divergence test. This is going to look at the overall difference between the two distributions. It's another entropy-based measurement. And in this table, you can see how we expect them to perform, basically, on the four types of channels we included. And IPCTC, pretty much anything can detect it because it's a simple channel, just on-off. It's going to make obvious impact on the shape and regularity of a traffic flow. But for the more complicated channels, like time replay, it's going to replay from actual traffic, so it's going to have a shape looking like a real flow. But since the regularity of it is going to be different still, the corrected conditional entropy test is going to be able to detect it. So next I want to explain how these were implemented using Bro. The first step was to gather training data so we could know what the normal flows look like. Uh, to create a legitimate distribution, we first use a bro script to gather a large number of IPDs for the common traffic types, like HTTP or SSH. Then we sort the IPDs and divide them into five or more equal groups. These cutoff values are then used to determine the bin numbers, which in delay is assigned. And using this training data, we can recognize abnormal shape and regularity in the flows we're monitoring and decide if we want to consider them a covert channel or not. We use a threshold, basically, if it's in the top one per, bottom 1% 1 for entropy, for example, or top for uh, KS tests or Komulgarov Smirnov test. Um, our policy script currently has five main functions. First, you check if a flow is large enough that it's worth testing. Uh, then we want to choose a size large enough to carry a reasonable amount of data. This way we can ignore some of the smaller flows that are very unlikely to have any reasonable capacity for covert timing channels. This lowers the amount of work needed, reducing packet loss and also the amount of memory we store. Um, if it is large enough, we can add it to this table of flows. And for each packet in these flows, we assign a bin value based on the delay since the last packets arrived. After enough delays have been gathered, we can perform the detection tests. Um, typically, we use around 2,000 IPDs. You can use fewer delays, but there's a trade-off between how many delays you use and how accurate the test is going to be. Depending on the channel type, you can get away with, for IPCTC, you could just use a few hundred delays. But for time replay, you typically need about 1,000. Um, so after enough have been gathered, we can perform the detection tests and compare the scores with the expected values for legitimate traffic. So to test the performance of these tests, we sent flows containing covert channels to a machine running Bro with our policy script. Um, IPCTC, Time Replay, and Jitterbug were all tested using these SHH scripts, which automated keystrokes with varying amounts of delays. Um, while model-based covert timing channels, we used a PCAP file injected with covert timing channels. Um, to start with, IPCTC was the simplest one to implement, since it's, again, just on-off. Um, using TCL and expect, we script commits, uh, connects to a receiver using SSH and sends a sequence of bits. So to send a one bit, you would send during some interval, say, 100 milliseconds. And to send a zero bit, you just not send a packet or keystroke during that interval. Um, for time replay channels, we recorded two sets of IPDs on our traffic and um, at ESNet. So these IPDs were then sorted into two groups based on some cutoff point. You put the lower set of delays into one group and the higher set in the other group. 
So to send a zero bit, you could send from the lower group of delays, and to send a one bit, you would replay from the higher set. And the last SSH script we created was for Jitterbug. So this adds small delays to each keystroke to embed covert channels and leak information. Um, for example, if you have a binary Jitterbug channel, to send a one bit, you could find a delay that has modulo w is not equal to zero, a zero bit is equal to zero. So you could have either multiples of 20 or 10 milliseconds. And then just when you receive it, the person decoding the channel would check if it's close to zero when you do the modulo. And for model-based covert timing channels, we used uh, traffic recorded on a 10 gigabit per second link in San Jose. 10% uh, of the flows in the speedcap file were randomly replaced with model-based traffic using either exponential or Pareto models. And this depends on what type of traffic application you're looking at. Like HTTP will typically have a Pareto distribution, so you'd want to have it look like that for the delays you're generating. And then the receiver can decode it using the inverse probability function. So what we did was we just replayed this traffic PCAP file using TCP replay to a machine running our bro policy. Um, here we have a table showing some of our results for the SSH channels. The covert channels tend to give a lower entropy scores for um, normal, compared to normal traffic and larger differences in the distribution. So the KST and KLD tests are gonna give higher results. Uh, the bolded values indicate ones we were able to detect with about 100% true positive rate and zero, close to zero false positive. So IPCTC, again, is really easy to detect. There's very clear differences in the entropy and other scores. But other ones like time replay are going to be harder to detect. And so far, the CCE test is the only one we could re re <coughs> excuse me, reliably detect all of these channels with but it's also our most expensive test. So that was another thing we looked at was how these tests affected our performance. The corrected conditional entropy was the most reliable, but it also tended to double the packet loss on some of the workers. And there is no significant increase in packet loss at all based on running with or without the policy script when we didn't include the CCE test. So this was the major source of performance issues mostly because it's looking at a large sequence of values. Um, so in conclusion, we found that correct, the covert timing channel detection can be efficiently implemented in bro, bro um, barring the CCE test at the moment. And the detection results closely match uh, previous results seen in other papers. Uh, different types of traffic are gonna require their own types of training data because the values for the delays are gonna be different for HTTP or SSH. There's not really a one size fits all thresholds you can use. And for future work, in addition to just gathering more data, uh, we'd like to add more types of channels like Liquid or Mimic. These are more advanced covert timing channel types that are able to evade even like corrected conditional entropy. Uh, we'd also like to add more types of detection. I was thinking uh, Welch's t-test is one it's supposed to perform about as well as the CCE test, but is also much less expensive. And another way we could improve this, we were thinking is potentially sending these large flows to a dedicated bro box and also using a GPU, which could quickly generate the CCE calculation. And finally, we need your help. There's a lot of room we can build on this, I think. And I'm hoping I can share the code eventually. I'm hoping this can serve as a framework for future covert timing channel research. Um, any questions? Yeah. Is there any reason you have to do the correlation correlation calculation online? Yeah, I think you could do that. But if you want to block it while it's still active, you would want to. Right, but the, the, how would your response policy change if you knew it was... And you, would you turn it off at Berkeley if you knew... Like yeah, well, yeah, like from an operational standpoint, it doesn't matter. It's the corporate already happened.
Yeah. Um, the CTC containing the PCAP was actually created by a previous grad student who made the model based covert timing channels. And then he created some scripts that will replace 10% roughly of the large flows and some PCAP file we gathered from another source with uh, these covert channels. Yeah. Um, it was about 7% with the CCE test on the workers, sometimes a little bit higher. Yeah. Hmm. Well, to get the expected bins, what we did was we gathered a large amount of traffic for whichever application we wanted, say HTTP. And once we gathered a large number of delays, we basically just sort all those values and then divide the values into five groups. So you take the lower fifth, and then the cutoff between the two, all the fifths will give you the five bins. Oh, with pre-existing traffic. Yeah. Uh, we just wanted a reasonably large amount so we could see how many false positives and true positives we'd get. That's much more than you'd expect, obviously, in real traffic. Yeah. So the, uh... Yeah, so basically, yeah, the CCE test... Normally, it requires you form a tree based on these uh, sequence of delays. So you take like 2,000 delays and divide them into 20 windows. And then you find the paths through each of those windows and form a tree and calculate the entropy at each level. So it's generally a very expensive test when you're trying to perform stuff on live traffic. And that has to be done. Like, yeah, that. Like for each flow. Hmm. But I do have a paper I've written recently on using a GPU to speed up this calculation using arrays, basically, where you just match the patterns in one large array. That can be done quickly on the GPU. Yeah. Um, we're still working on that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, not on the traffic we looked at. We were able to notice some things got picked up, like um, automated FTP flow. So this might actually, same technique could be used to detect other types of automated traffic. Yeah, I don't know offhand. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. The last one was just about which processor we use where we saw the packet loss. And right now we don't know offhand. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, right now I'm hoping that this, along with other high-speed packet processing tasks, maybe working with a GPU is going to be part of my dissertation. Okay. I'm still um, trying to decide that, discussing with my advisor. Okay. Um, Deepak Gosal. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, thank you, everyone. <laughs>